Hello, and thank you for the invitation. As mentioned, my topic is ethanol ablation of metastatic cervical lymph nodes in the neck. And for the most part, we're talking about papillary cancer. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, the goals of this session are to go over the, um, the, the very important points of pa patient selection for ethanol ablation, the technique of ethanol ablation for cervical lymph nodes, the potential complications from the procedure, and the importance of following up patients with that have been ablated to be sure that it's adequate treatment. And some, uh, some numerical data on the, the, uh, how effective ethanol ablation is for cervical lymph nodes, particularly in papillary thyroid cancer. Ethanol ablation has a long history at Mayo and Rochester. The first uh, thyroid cancer patient that was ablated was in uh, 1991. It was a medullary cancer that was uh, resistant to any other therapy in the neck and was treated successfully with long-term survival with ethanol. The first papillary cancer was treated in 1993 um, with uh, ethanol. And the first public ser series came from a Mayo in a small series of 14 patients with 29 lymph nodes. These patients were not surgical candidates or declined surgery and were unresponsive to other therapies. All the ablated lymph nodes decreased in size with even 9 or 31 percent disappearing. All decreased in volume, uh, 85 percent at one year and 96 percent at two years. Fortunately, in this group, there were no complications, no significant complications. Uh, of note, two patients that, uh, where the lymph nodes were, all the lymph nodes were treated uh, with ethanol responded. They had additional disease occurred that did require surgery. But the lymph nodes, the particular lymph node that was treated, was treated successfully. One follow-up study and a larger study, Norwegian and more recent from 2011, had uh, 69 patients, uh, which uh, 63 could be followed in 109 lymph nodes. They had 84% with a complete response, which they de defined as absence of the lymph node of follow-up, or it, it becoming a small hypovascular scar-like area, four millimeters or less in diameter. Eight percent of theirs were considered failures with a mean observation time of about three years. Once again, it's encouraging this larger series had no significant complications. So much of alcohol ablation, to do it well, re revolves around relationships with the other doctors and patients, patients uh, selecting the correct patients to treat. Um, the patient, a typical patient that comes to us for treatment has had two or more surgeries and has another recurrence, or has had a recent surgery and has residual disease, basically potentially a missed lymph node or one that became apparent soon after surgery. For, for our services, that is ethanol ablation, we want limited metastatic disease in the neck, uh, probably less than 10 millimeters is ideal, although we do do larger ones. And it's likely we'd like it less than five, but of course uh, patients sometimes would still want ablation with more, so we do uh, tread in the higher numbers, especially if you consider the number of ablations we do over time. That is, a patient comes on day one and we do three or four lymph nodes and they come a year later and those are well treated but there's three or four new ones and they still don't want surgery and the surgeon still doesn't want to do surgery. And, and often in this age of the internet and education, these thyroid cancer patients, particularly ones that have several surgeries, are on the internet looking for sites to have alternative treatments that are less invasive than surgery or radioactive iodine or neck radiation. So we'll be contacted. Of course, what I would do if in all instances refer them to endocrine because we always have a team approach to this. We don't do anything in isolation. As stated, there's a close collaboration with our Department of Endocrine. 
surgeons, oncologists, and radiologists make sure we're doing the appropriate treatment. And they, the endocrine doctors really need to uh, pull in all the data to make sure that ablation is right for this patient. For ethanol ablation, what we do, small lesions are best, which is nice because it complements what surgeons do uh, in that they often treat the larger, or do treat the larger lesions. Recent ATA guidelines from 2015 recommend surgery for central lesions with a short axis diameter of eight millimeters or greater or lateral lesions uh, greater than 10. Um, so this obviously is the larger side of things greater than, so the smaller lesions are, have other options, including ablation with uh, thermal ablation techniques, ethanol, or even observation. Treatment options, uh, as mentioned, with small recurrences, e our observation is still an option, uh, and many of these don't grow over time, particularly when the TSH is well suppressed. We're in the business of my, what might be termed berry picking, which to endocrine doctors and surgeons may mean uh, go pick, identifying one lymph node that has macroscopic disease detected by ultrasound that we treat with ablation or RFA. Um, also can be treated in a berry picking type fashion by surgeons, but hopefully we can uh, treat more of the smaller ones with less invasive things in surgery. I, of course, uh, the other options that we leave to the endocrine doctors, the TSH it's, uh, suppression, radioactive iodine, external beam, decide when that's appropriate. Complicated slide, but I'd just like to sort of point out uh, in this table that I made, the pluses are a good thing, and as we go from ethanol ablation to thermal ablation techniques to surgery, uh, ethanol definitely wins here in the less evasive uh, side of things, shorter recovery, and repeatability. You know, these are going to be potentially our patients or my patient or your patient if you go down this route for years. So as new occur recurrences occur, at some point, the surgeon, or the patient, or somebody else will say, no more surgery. Um, and as they switch to uh, small lesions with ethanol ablation, we can repeat this. Um, there's no limit to how much we repeat it, basically. Uh, we've had patients with more than 20 recurrences over many, many years that we've treated and controlled. Um, so the repeatability aspect of ethanol is uh, one of the gold star things. The build cost is less, that's a good thing, but the, the bad part about cost is uh, you, I would suggest pre-approval since it's more likely to be turned down as uh, possibly ex experimental or an unproven by an insurance provider. It's getting better over time and as we write letters back to the insurance company and uh, people that make decisions about whether things will be paid, it's getting uh, fairly well reimbursed routinely but there's still, it's not universal. So. I would suggest pre-approval for any patient. They, that's a, um, to get a bill after uh, three or four weeks for a big number um, is shocking to the patient. And it, it sets in, in motion a lot of uh, letters back and forth. So pre-approval, I would suggest. Now, of course, there are obviously advantages of surgery. It's complete removal. It comes out, and they can see that the whole thing's removed. And therefore, there's less imaging follow-up, less need for retreatment. Um, as I will mention later, these lesions have to be followed to see if they need additional treatment and follow-up. But keep in mind that surgery and these more focal things like RFA and ethanol ablation are really complementary. Ideally, we, if the patient is going to have treatment on a small lesion, um, Ethanol or RFA are possibilities, and, and um, ethanol more at our institution than RFA, and larger lesions go to surgery. We often work with the surgeons too. If a patient has disease at more than one site, uh, they, perhaps they would do the central compartment that has bulkier disease, and 
not wanting to open or incise a second compartment laterally will treat the lateral disease with ethanol. So they're really more complementary than competitive. The treatment is simple. We just slowly inject 98% alcohol into the uh, tumor, tend to treat the deeper areas first so the micro bubbles from the ethanol do not obscure the more superficial treatment that comes later. Uh, of course, you want to inject slowly so you can watch it disperse in the nodule. And if it's not dispersing well, readjust the needle. Or if you start seeing leakage from your needle track or elsewhere, reposition your needle again. The goal, of course, is to treat the whole nodule, cover it at one time, at least one time during the course of your treatment with uh, microbubbles, and eliminate the visible blood flow as detectable by color Doppler. We use small needles, 25 and 27 gauge. Uh, usually use a 1 cc syringe so we can control the injection rate best and the high resolution ultrasound, of course, continuously monitoring it. Of course, these are simple and now becoming uh, less and less expensive. And with uh, those combination things, it's become a uh, more and more common practice in the endocrine world, too. You can see a, an outpatient visit and, and treatments happening more based on my conversations with the endocrine doctors from other places. Just a simple uh, ablation of a small lesion, the needle's placed in the middle, and you light it up with ethanol. It contains microbubbles, so it, it does uh, brighten up and uh, become white. This is, of course, the ones we like, nice, small, central, or nice, small, lesions that take very little alcohol to whiten up. And then once they have been saturated in ethanol, the blood flow does go away. It sclerosis the arteries and veins. A larger lesion that you know, takes more repositioning, more ethanol. You'll see the ethanol uh, dispersed at different spots as the needle is moved around. You'll see there's a little leakage back toward the needle track. That, that's toward muscle, so it's not as concerning for, as leakage toward deeper structures and nerves. Um, but that's something that when you see leakage along a needle track or outside the tumor, that's the time to reposition the needle and make sure all the alcohol that you can stays in the tumor. In general, it's a very well-tolerated procedure. As mentioned in the prior, uh, more old, older studies, there was no significant complications uh, reported in those series that were um, around 100 or around 30. Most people are, have a little focal swelling at the, or at the treatment site. Um, and sometimes, or it's actually more than fairly frequently, patients will report referred pain in um, unusual locations like their teeth and sinuses and the top back of their head, um, in their chest and arms. You know, the, the neck is a nerve-rich area and this referred pain isn't surprising, but fortunately it only lasts minutes. I've had no patient have prolonged referred pain. There is a risk of nerve damage. Um, the first two series report no significant complications. Uh, but there, we have had, since then, the rare patients has recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, damage and hoarseness. It's usually transient, but not always. There's at least two that are permanently hoarse from ethanol ablation and had implants to improve their hoarseness. But there is potential damage to any nerve that's in the vicinity. Um, for a while there, all the significant complications were that we had that I had were hoarseness, temporary usually. But then as you do more and more at different locations, uh, we've had a, two Horner syndromes from a sympathetic uh, ganglion chain injury, one phrenic that was temporary, and there's always a potential for other nerves to be damaged, although I don't know of any vagal damage or brachioplexus plexus permanent damage from the procedure. To minimize those risks, we use the minimum amount of alcohol necessary and keep the, amount of, keep the alcohol in the tumor as best we can. One, I would say, trick or one uh, way to 
select patients that may have uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve damage uh, before the before you inject alcohol is inject a tumor of local anesthetic. If the patient becomes uh, hoarse from the local anesthetic, there's a good likelihood they'll become more permanently hoarse from the alcohol. So select ones you don't want to in, uh, with injection of a local anesthetic. And that'll wear off in the usual time period. And I don't treat those with ethanol if they become hoarse with a uh, local anesthetic. Follow-up is important. We do it in three to six months intervals. The goal is to become avascular and much smaller. Serum tumor markers are uh, followed, and we repeat the, the uh, injection if there's persistent vascularity or growth. Sur surgery is rarely needed in patients that have gone down the ethanol ablation route for the nodule. Just uh, one of our uh, endocrine doctors probably has the longest follow-up uh, in 2012, 19 years, 164 bladed nodules, all 43% disappeared entirely and all have become small, much less vascular, and uh, rarely require surgery. As you manage, these patients are managed, we just have to keep in mind, although surgery is great, it takes out all the tumor, these patients are going to often be recurrent patients so we have to choose one that's repeatable, perhaps not quite as complete, but for a indolent, usually indolent tumor that may recur several times and grow very slowly, these less complete but less invasive, less, less costly and more repeatable procedures such as uh, ethanol ablation and thermal ablation need to be uh, considered. Finally, uh, just briefly, conclusions. We, in our practice, it's, Ethanol ablation is effective in treating metastatic papillary cancer in the selected patients I discussed. It has a low complication uh, risk. It eliminates the need for repeat surgery in most of these patients and does require close collaborations with experts in surgery and endocrine. Thank you.